Hi, I'm Michael Sharp. I'm the Dean of Case Western Reserve University School of Law, and I'd love to welcome you to our virtual book discussion. Turns out that we have 500 registered participants. This is the first time that we've ever had an online event reach capacity. So big, big day for us. Let me begin with a couple of housekeeping matters. First, we will be taking questions from the 500 people out there when we reach 15 minutes left to go in the program. If you would like to ask a question, what you need to do is click on the chat button. That's the chat button, not the Q&A button. And then just type in your question. And our producer, Eric Seiler, will select questions that he will then ask the panelists. Let me introduce our moderator. We are very fortunate today to have our moderator for this event be Kevin Nealer. He's an alum of Case Western Reserve University School of Law, and he serves as a principal of the Scowcroft Group, where he provides emerging market risk and investment analysis to multinational companies, banks, and insurance firms. He is also a senior advisor to the Simon Chair in Political Economy of the Center for Strategic and International Studies. During the Obama administration, Kevin served on the board of the Overseas Private Investment Corporation and later as a member of the President's Intelligence Advisory Board. That's the bipartisan panel that provides independent guidance on America's intelligence community to the President. A former career diplomat, Kevin served on the staff of the Senate Majority Leader where he worked on trade, security, and intelligence issues. A member of the Council on Foreign Relations and co-author of its report on China's WTO membership, Kevin was a Fulbright professor in the People's Republic of China. He chairs the University of Michigan's Washington program. He's a guest lecturer at Georgetown University Center for Continuing and Executive Education and at the US Military Academy at West Point. I could actually go on and on, but it is now my pleasure to turn things over to Kevin Nealer. Kevin. Dean Sharp, thanks so much. It's a singular honor uh, to be with my three colleagues today and to talk about a, a, a project that uh, they ought to have great pride in. Uh, it's uh, for the 500 who are watching this. Um, this is a book you definitely want to read. I was saying to Michael beforehand, it's, it's not just a, a brilliant uh, expose of uh, the international law issues of the Syria crisis, but it's a foundational work on customary international law. Um, uh, let me start out with brief introductions if I can of our panelists. Uh, we've already met uh, Dean Scharf. Uh, he's the Dean of Case Western Reserve University School of Law and the Joseph C. Hotstetler, Baker Hotstetler Professor of Law at the law school. He began his career as an attorney advisor in the UN Affairs Office at the U.S. Department of State, and he's authored over 20 books and 100 articles. He's also the host, as many of you know, of NPR's Talking Foreign Policy radio program. Uh, Milena Stereo, Professor Stereo, is uh, the Charles R. Emmerich Jr. and Calfee Halter and Griswold Professor of Law at Cleveland Marshall School of Law. Um, she began a career as an attorney uh, in the New York City law firm of Cleary Gottlieb Steeman Hamilton, and she's published five books, including one that recently won a National Book of the Year Award. Congratulations. Uh, Dr. Paul Williams is the co-founder of the Public International Law and Policy Group. He holds the Rebecca I. Grazier Professorship in Law uh, and International Relations here in Washington at American University, where he teaches both in the law school, in the School of International Service, rather, and at the Washington College of Law. For the past seven years, Dr. Williams has been advising the Syrian opposition in the Syrian peace negotiation process. And Paul, we thank you for that important work. Um, beginning with, a, with an anecdote, uh, we had about eight years ago uh, at the Skokroff Group, uh, a brilliant young intern uh, who came to us from the intelligence community. He was uh, uh, on a year sabbatical uh, working uh, on his, uh, master's degree at the School of International Studies at Johns Hopkins. He took the, the, the time uh, at, at, Sco at the Scowcroft Group uh, 
to sit down with, uh, with my boss, uh, General Brent Scowcroft, uh, and he'd come from uh, a particularly challenging task. Uh, he was on the working group, the interagency working group that, uh, that Michael Scharf, uh, a process Michael Scharf knows so well uh, at the State Department. Uh, and he sat down with the, one of the grand old men of American foreign policy to try to get from him a sense what was uh, wh wh what were they doing right and what were they doing wrong in the working group and indeed how was U.S. government policy serving the national interest on this most exquisitely complicated uh, issues the Syrian conflict uh, the poor young man explained uh, where they were in this process looked into Scowcroft's face. Uh, hoping for a benediction, uh, a ratification of the policy and process. And Scowcroft just looked back at him and said, you do understand some problems have no solution. Um, indeed, uh, that's a reality that, uh, that comes through in this book. And uh, Paul, I, I wonder if you can give us a, a, a quick kind of dramatist persona, because while we all have some awareness of uh, of, of the nature and complexity of the Syrian conflict. Could you talk us through kind of where it started, who the players are, and what the fighting is about? Sure, Kevin. So the conflict in Syria started out in much the same way that the other Arab Spring transitions started out. It was in 2011. There were street protests for democracy, for rule of law, for greater inclusion but it almost immediately took a dramatic turn uh, into a situation where there's over 12 million uh, displaced persons, six million within Syria, six million outside of Syria, and almost half a million killed. Uh, and then, you know, sort of endless uh, atrocity crimes that one can see. And what happened in Syria, which was different in so many of the other transitions, is there was a spill in, you know, oftentimes, uh, and, and you know from your time in the government uh, that there's a worry of a spillover of a conflict. And a lot of folks were worried that the Syria conflict would spill in Lebanon and other places. But the reality is everyone seemed to pile in to protect their interest. The Russians are involved to protect the naval base. They engage in airstrikes. They have troops on the ground. The Iranians have come in in order to keep their uh, corridor open to, to Lebanon. The Iranians have pulled in Hezbollah. The Americans have troops on the ground. The French, the British had troops. Uh, Al -Qaeda, um, uh, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and even Al Qaeda came to the fight, followed quickly by, by ISIS. And so you have this amazingly complex crisis where basically every neighboring state is in Syria. The Tur Turkey even has a buffer zone where they've moved in 12 kilometers or 20, 20 miles, 12 kilometers in order to protect, protect their interests. And so this is mixing atrocities, mixing intense international engagement, all in a struggle for democracy and freedom for the people of Syria, which has gone badly wrong. Well, that's, that's very helpful. Uh, listening to, to Paul's description, Milena, uh, I, know, I know this is a question you get a lot from students and it's a question you, you get um, as, as you uh, speak around the country mindful of what Paul just said and this, this uh, uh, incredible complexity, um, why should we care about uh, Syria and, and the conflict? Uh, and it, 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 given the humanitarian crisis there, obviously our heart goes out to those people, but how do you describe what vital U.S. interests are at stake in Syria? So um, this has been one of the worst humanitarian crises um, ever. Um, it's a conflict uh, to which we see no end. It has been raging for the past nine years, going on its 10th year. And it's a conflict that has involved multiple nations, which are now fighting proxy wars. There, as Paul mentioned, um, there are multiple countries that have been um, involved, including Russia, Turkey, just to name a few. Um, and it's a conflict that has the potential that has already destabilized the entire region, the Middle East. And it's a conflict that has also had a tremendous impact on the rest of the world. One area that I would mention, and this is actually one of the chapters in the book, is the impact that the conflict has had on global migration. So think of the hundreds of thousands of Syrian migrants and refugees 
who have now moved mostly to Europe, but throughout the rest of the world, um, that has had a destabilizing effect um, in Europe on many European countries. Um, it has also sparked a new use of universal jurisdiction, and we'll get to that um, a little bit later during this, this hour. But it's a conflict that, that cannot be viewed as just an internal war that has to do with Syria. It is truly a conflict that has a tremendous impact on the Middle East and on the rest of the world. Thank you so much. That's very helpful. Michael, I, uh, in the prologue, I was struck with the fact that you, you, be, you introduce us to this problem by a real-life uh, adventure uh, that you and Paul had on the streets of Istanbul. I, I have to tell you, it sounded like the worst nightmare that every foreign service officer has ever had. That, you know, what situation do you not want to be in? But, but can you talk about what occurred and, and uh, what its significance was? And who were you waiting for when everything went wrong? Sure. Um, yeah, this was our Raiders of the Lost Ark moment. Um, it was June 10th, 2013. And Paul and I had been asked to do a workshop with uh, Syrian judges, prosecutors, defense counsel, who back then were optimistically interested in having an international or a regional prosecution of al-Assad, um, the, the leader of Syria. And so they had snuck across the border and had made it into Turkey, which was a nice, neutral, and safer place for us, we thought, to have these meetings. Um, unfortunately, that was also the day that there were student protests at Taksim Square. And what they were protesting was nothing short of the fact that Erdogan had declared that there were going to be curfews and the students, all these college kids, were not gonna be able to get alcohol after 10 o'clock. Um, that seemed to hit hard <laughs> at what they wanted. So anyway, we're about a mile from Taxi Square. We're sitting at a Starbucks discussing what we're going to be doing. And all of a sudden, all the kids that were at Taxi Square showed up at our little square, our outdoor Starbucks. And there were about 50,000 people. And it was very exciting. There were noisemakers and a lot of energy. And suddenly it didn't smell so good because there was tear gas being fired right over our heads. And then we could hear the water cannons going off and the rubber bullets being shot. And suddenly the entire crowd just became like a giant crowd of running people. And it was like, I guess uh, we joked afterwards running with the bulls at Paploma or something. But, you know, honestly, our, our fight or flight um, instincts kicked in, and mostly it was flight. And we ran as fast as I've ever run. Um, and, and we didn't want to get trampled. And, and finally, we, we did get away from the area and we were able to get back to our hotel. Now, the interesting thing is the next morning, we did have our first session with the Syrians. And I asked them, you know, were you around during this really exciting moment last night when there was this protest and the stampede? And they said, oh, yes, yes, we were around. And I said, um, what did you do? And they said, well, we didn't run away. We ran toward the um, police and, and the riot uh, military. We picked up tear gas canisters. We threw it back. And I was like, holy moly, were you, weren't you worried? Weren't you scared by this? And they said something that to this day I'm struck with. They said, listen, in Syria, we are faced with barrel bombs. We are faced with scud missiles. We are faced with chemical weapons. We have lost our close relatives and loved ones. And, and this was not scary to us. This was democracy and we were excited to be part of it. Now I have to say some of the people that we met with that day are no longer with us. Uh, some of them have become refugees as Milena was mentioning and some are still in Syria fighting, um, fighting for their lives and for democracy. So we dedicated our book, um, copy, to, to the people that we had met with and all the others that are fighting the good fight. Michael, it's a powerful and chastening story as we all sit here in the midst of, uh, of, of what we describe as the COVID crisis. Um, I, I, it causes me to reflect on something we say to clients, all risk is relative, right? Um, Melena, you had the emotional maturity not to be there for, for that particular moment. Uh, I, wanna, I wanna come to you and, and ask you to describe the concept really that's at the core of the book um, and, and that really makes it required reading for the rest of us. Uh, 
you, you three are a proponent of something you call a Grodian moment. Um, and, and you examine in the book whether and how Syria and the Syrian conflict uh, is one of those moments. Can you unpack that for us a little bit? And I, I've got to ask, can you kind of compare and contrast with the notion of instant custom that some of us remember to disadvantage? Um, what, what's, what's the difference and, and what is a Grodian moment? Sure. So um, a Grotian moment, you know, it's an obvious reference to uh, Hugo Grotius, uh, who is considered to be the founder of international law. Um, a Grotian moment is a time of accelerated formation of customary law due to some catastrophic or cataclysmic world events. So normally customary law develops over decades, if not centuries, in a very slow process. Here we're talking about rapid, a rapid development of customary norms, really as a response to some cataclysmic world events, such as, for example, the Syrian conflict. Another, um, another Grotian moment, which we described in the book, is the Nuremberg Tribunal. Um, and there are a few others, we'll, we'll get to those later. But we're really talking about some, um, um, some very significant, often catastrophic event in response to which customary law develops more rapidly. Now, that this is different than instant customary law, which you mentioned, because we're not talking about instantaneous formation of customary norms. We're talking simply about a more accelerated formation of customary norms, which still requires some state practice and which still requires some Security Council or General Assembly resolutions or some other evidence of um, global communities consensus as to the evolution of such norms, which again are, are really seen as, as necessary to respond to, um, to a crisis. Indeed, that's very helpful. Uh, uh, Michael, do you want to react to what Milena just said? And Milena, I want to come back to you. Uh, in particular, uh, you've, you've done a lot with the Nuremberg uh, trials. As, uh, could you use that as a point of departure to kind of build on some yeah. of what Milena has shared with us? Yeah, Kevin, that's probably helpful. So you know, normally international scholars and lawyers think of customary international law as a slow crystallization, you know, that would take hundreds of years. Think about, you know, the law of the sea and the law of piracy, things that, you know, really took centuries to develop. Sometimes world events are as Milena described them. And as Paul described, the Syria conflict is a candidate for this, where things have to speed up. And in this case, it was because the Security Council was paralyzed mostly by Russia's veto, and there was not the ability to have treaty law created. And so customary international law was created by custom pioneers. And as we'll talk about later, there are some really exciting new developments in international law. But the paradigm for that is really the Nuremberg trials. Before Nuremberg, this is the international trial that occurred after World War II, there was no such thing as human rights law. There was no such thing as international criminal law. What a country did to its own people was its own business. And the rest of the international community was not allowed to intervene or care or do anything about it. Nuremberg changed all that. They had the first ever international prosecution of the leaders of a country. The General Assembly of the UN passed the Nuremberg principles and very quickly an entire new field of international law, both human rights law and international criminal law were developed. And the Nuremberg principles are to this day a, a body of law that are cited and are binding. All of that happened within one year. It didn't take centuries. It was a just hugely paradigm shifting development. It was a Grotian moment. But Milena, to, to your point, that it, 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 it did nonetheless had uh, to go through a process that those of us uh, who've worked in this field understand. Could you say a little more about how it met those requirements, how the Grotian moment was, uh, was satisfied on an accelerated basis and what it meant? You, Kevin, you mean in the Syria situation? In particular, yeah. yes. Yeah. 
So in this book, we examine different um, areas of international law where we think that the Syrian conflict has constituted a Groshen moment. Um, so one of the um, examples that I can mention is, or, or let, me, let me just mention two examples. One is the um, global migration, which I already mentioned. And then the other would be the use of um, humanitarian intervention. So when it comes to migration, because of the magnitude of the Syrian crises, because the, of the influx of Syrian migrants and refugees throughout the world, this has pushed the international community to start developing a global compact on refugees as well as a global compact on migration. So these are um, soft law instruments as we call them. These are basically non-binding instruments, but we see a movement by uh, you know, groups of states to sign on to these global compacts on refugees and, and, and migrants, which will essentially then uh, delineate shared responsibilities among states that are responding to refugee and migrant crises. So there's a draft global compact on refugees and a draft global compact, compact on migrants that are available um, online that states have been slowly um, signing on to. And then in the area of um, self-defense, and this is just, uh, I'm sorry, not self-defense, humanitarian intervention, this is just another example. Um, we saw that when it comes to Syria, we saw that um, there were airstrikes launched against President Assad's regime um, two years ago with the rationale of humanitarian intervention. President Assad had used chemical weapons in Syria against Syri Syrian um, civilians. And in response to that, we saw other nations, and in particular, the UK and France and, and the United States, but the UK in particular developed a legal rationale claiming that humanitarian intervention is a legal use of force. Normal, you know, this is not in the UN Charter. The UN Charter says that states can use force against each other um, only with Security Council authorization or in self-defense. The, the um, UN Charter does not mention humanitarian intervention, but we see the magnitude of the Syrian crisis essentially pushing global powers to accept the legality, the legal rationale for humanitarian intervention. Uh, Paul, uh, Milena's uh, uh, comment reminds me that uh, uh, you know we've we've stepped out of the normal uh, realm of conflict resolution, uh, and 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 the, the the book is is powerful because it takes apart uh, the role of the Security Council, or let's say it takes in new directions thinking about the role of Security Council. Could you say more about Russia's persistent use of the veto? Uh, and, and what that means? The Russians. Um, so the Russians have been very active in the context of Syria, protecting their interests. As we mentioned in the introduction, they have uh, a naval base. Now they have two air bases. They have used their veto at the Security Council to quash a French attempt to enact a resolution that would have referred uh, the matter to the International Criminal Court so that you would have some accountability for Assad and, and the members of his regime, as well as, as ISIS and Al-Qaeda. Uh, they've also, though, much more cleverly used their position on the Security Council to divert the peace process into a process that they prefer. And maybe we can talk about this, this later, but they moved it from, or attempted to move it from a peace negotiation process into a constitutional process, which they were then hosting in, in Sochi. So they had their Olympics there, they had all their buildings. They then thought, oh, let's use it for a peace process. The toilets still don't work, but they wanted to use it for the peace process. Um, they also created a ceasefire process uh, and they moved it to Astana in Kazakhstan, but it was basically a Russian process. And I mention this because we oftentimes think, oh, the Russians are like the Capital One commercial. No, no, no but they're much more sophisticated than that. They propose, they support, they draft resolutions that suit their interests, protect their allies, um, and then they use the veto as, as the last resort. And so we've seen, quite frankly, a very, <clears throat> a very active Security Council presence up until the point where it became serious. And then the Russians have done, I think, nearly a dozen vetoes in the last couple of years. And let me add a, a story about how the UN has reacted to those vetoes. So one of the resolutions that was very important was to investigate the use of chemical weapons against the civilian population by the Assad regime. And that was vetoed. 
and there was a resolution to create an investigation and that was vetoed. And as Paul mentioned, there was a resolution to refer the matter to the International Criminal Court. That was vetoed. Well, there's a, a friend of ours named Christian Van Avasser. He's the ambassador from Liechtenstein. And he went to the General Assembly and he said, listen, the Security Council is paralyzed. Let's create an investigative commission to look into this through the General Assembly. And I'm sure a lot of the countries said, well, we don't have the power to do that. Only the Security Council did. But he said, again, the Security Council is paralyzed. We have to do something. And so another Groschen moment, I would argue, was when the General Assembly almost unanimously against Russia's and, and some of Russia's friends' opposition voted to create this investigative commission. And then Russia said that was illegal. That was ultra virus. That meant that the General Assembly acted outside of its authority. But the rest of the countries of the world just stood up and said, no, we're going to do this. And I think this is a major power shift away from the Security Council to the General Assembly. It's similar to something that happened in 1950 when Russia, then the Soviet Union, had been vetoing any effort to create peacekeeping forces. And so the General Assembly passed the Uniting for Peace resolution that allowed it under extraordinary circumstances to create peacekeeping forces. And then the Soviet Union tried to take that to the International Court of Justice, which ruled against the Soviet Union. But for the last you know, 60 years, there hasn't been this kind of General Assembly effort um, to, to take on the Security Council and exercise this kind of power, and suddenly there is. It's, it's a paradigm shift, and it's happening because of events in Syria. Thanks so much, Michael. Uh, Milena, anything else you want to add? Sure. Um, since it seems to me we're, we're um, identifying new Groschen moments, it's going to be for part two of, of the book. <laughs> um, another, um, another thing that I would mention is, you know, Paul talked about the Security Council and the Russian um, and the Chinese veto in the Security Council. Um, I would like to mention here the work of one of our colleagues, Professor Jennifer Tran from NYU, who has actually a book coming out in June, in just a month, um, where she talks about the legal limits on the use of veto power. So her argument really is that there ought to be legal limits on um, the veto holding states um, in when we're talking about resolutions that have to do with atrocity crimes. And so there might be a Groschen moment developing with respect to putting limitations on the use of the veto power um, when we're talking about atrocity crimes. Um, and obviously her work is also driven by the Syrian crisis. You know, that was sort of the starting point, the fact that we have powerful nations vetoing um, resolutions which would have provided relief, um, you know, in response to this humanitarian catastrophe. Kevin, you're muted. Forgive me. Uh, Milena, you before mentioned to us the the uh, profound refugee uh, and the unprecedented refugee crisis that's created. Could you say a little more about uh, how international law has responded to this challenge? I mean, you were you were going in that direction a moment ago. Uh, say a little more, if you would, please. Sure. So, um, first of all, different states have had to respond in different ways. So, in the wake of this um, uh, movement, if you will, of Syrian migrants and refugees, different European states and Turkey have had to um, change the way in which they shape their own asylum and immigration policies. So, for example, in Germany, they started, as opposed to treating the Syrian um, uh, arrivals as um, uh, potential asylum seekers, they started instead focusing on processing work visas, which would allow them to stay in Germany temporarily. In Turkey, they started using uh, biometric data to process um, the individuals coming from Syria to be able to then better keep track of, you know, sort of who came and, and what their particular um, circumstances were. We also saw then at the UN level, um, the development of the global compacts, as I mentioned earlier, the global compact on refugees and the global compact on migrants. Um, I should mention also that, for example, with respect to the UK, some have argued that the Syrian migration has been one of the driving forces behind Brexit. You know, perhaps Brexit would have happened as is, but that that was one of the um, driving forces. Um, and then um, another thing that I would mention is 
the fact that the influx of Syrian refugees and migrants in some countries, particularly in Germany, has basically facilitated the use of universal jurisdiction prosecutions in Germany. So there's a case, a prominent case ongoing as we speak in Germany, where two Syrian um, you know, alleged perpetrators of atrocities are being prosecuted in the German courts under German national law based on this principle of universal jurisdiction. And what has facilitated those cases is, A, the fact that both of these individuals were in Germany, so it was much easier to actually arrest them. And two, the fact that many of the victims and witnesses are also in Germany. So this, this has facilitated the prosecution because normally universal jurisdiction-based prosecutions are not a very popular concept because they're logistically so difficult because the evidence, the witnesses, the victims, the perpetrators themselves might all be located abroad. So here we have the presence of a large Syrian community, the witnesses are there, some of the witnesses have the documentary evidence, and then the perpetrators, you know, are also in Germany. Very helpful, thank you. Michael, one of the things that uh, uh, you've, you've devoted a, a, a very thoughtful discussion to in the book um, is legitimacy of use of force in self-defense involving ISIS. Now, the traditional view, you know better than I, is that the use of force against non-state actors in another state is only going to be permitted if the territorial state was in effect in control of those non-state actors. Uh, how has the Syrian conflict changed this principle and changed how you think about it? So there were four different cases in which the International Court of Justice reaffirmed the principle that you just said, which is one country just cannot attack uh, re um, rebels or terrorists in another country unless there's evidence that that other country was in control of the rebels or terrorists. That has all changed. And it changed because the United States started to articulate this view that when a country is unable or unwilling to prevent rebels or terrorists in its territory from being a threat to other countries, that the other countries sh should be allowed to use self-help and protect themselves. But for a long time, even our closest allies did not accept the US argument. And that all changed in November of 2013 when the ISIS people, started attacking outside of the region. And as you all know, they attacked the um, sports stadium and the discotheque in Paris, and they killed people from over 100 different countries. And suddenly, the UN Security Council was so concerned about that ISIS has broken loose and was a threat to everybody that they endorsed the United States view. And they passed a resolution unanimously that said that countries could use force against ISIS. Now they didn't do this under chapter seven, which is the power of the Security Council to authorize the use of force. Instead, they did this as a reaffirmation of the right of self-defense. And that is huge because that meant that the world had, through the Security Council, unanimously decided that the US position was now customary international law. Again, a Groshen moment on that date. Uh, um, Paul, in your opening comments, when you were describing the complexity, uh, you promised that we could come back to this concept of uh, what happened in October 2019 when Turkey went into Syria, established these buffer zones uh, to protect itself from what it characterized as Kurdish terrorists. Was that a legitimate use of force under this new principle that Michael's talking about of self-defense? So in the Turkey situation, and this is the conflict within, within the conflict, you know, Turkey has um, conflict with, with Syria. It's done quite a bit to protect uh, the areas where the Free Syrian Army and the democratic forces are operating. But at the same time, uh, it's been taking on the, the Kurdish forces, which the Americans have been working with as allies to fight ISIS. And so you have this this conundrum where the Americans have created uh, the Syrian Defense Forces, which are a combination of Kurdish forces and Arab forces that we've trained and vetted special forces with to basically clear out ISIS uh, through the eastern, the northeastern, and then moving south uh, in Syria. But then the Turks have moved in 
and created a 12 mile, mile buffer zone. Now what's different between what Turkey has done in this case and what Michael has explained in self-defense and what's happened in, in um, humanitarian intervention, there's been no clear articulation of a legal principle. You know, as Michael has laid out, there was a clear articulation of what we, the Americans international community was doing. There was Security Council engagement. We could say the same thing about humanitarian intervention. Here, Turkey has just waived self-defense in the same way that Russia waived humanitarian intervention in Crimea, South Ossetia, Abkhazia. And that's the concern that, you know, as lawyers, the three of us have, is that you need to be able to put a legal framework around what's happening and then hold countries accountable to the law. It may be a Groschen moment, it may be instant customary national law, it may be, you know, other, other types of law, but it's important to have that framework, otherwise you have this willy-nilly adventurism, adventurism and then just waving around self-determination, humanitarian intervention, sorry. Self-defense. There is self-determination too, but we can get to that. Well, later. And, and just to chime in, the other problem with the Turkish attacks against the Kurds is that if it is self-defense, it has to still fall within necessity and proportionality. And rather than just attacking limited targets, they've really had quite a broad attack. And they've killed a lot of innocent civilians. And in both cases, that's not proportionate. And they really haven't proven the necessity because what they're saying basically is in our country, we have Kurds that are terrorists and therefore the Kurds that are in Syria are somehow a threat to us, but they haven't shown enough of a close linkage to make the argument for necessity. If I can, I want to go back to this um, notion of the uh, sometimes insurmountable speed bump presented by the Security Council. Uh, the, the book includes a chapter about the legitimacy of humanitarian intervention in light of the joint U.S., uh, U.K., French bombing of the Syrian chemical weapons facilities. Now, the traditional view is that humanitarian intervention is only going to be permitted with the authorization of the Security Council. Those of us who worked in the U.N. system have uh, uh, have uh, both benefited from and, and I suppose manipulated this concept. Uh, but how has the Syrian conflict changed that principle in your view? And I, I want to ask, start with both Milena and Paul on this if I can. So the one, you know, for example, if you, if you compare the humanitarian intervention that, to, or, you know, the airstrikes um, that took place against the Assad leadership two years ago, by um, the US, UK, and France. You compare that to, for example, the NATO-led airstrikes against the, at the time, Federal Republic of Yugoslavia in the late 90s. Back in 1999, NATO countries were advancing the argument that the NATO intervention was uh, not necessarily legal, but that it was legitimate, that those states had moral authority to act. The State Department was obviously crafting this sui generis, um, you know, policy-based argument, but nobody was really advancing a legal rationale. Nobody was saying this type of humanitarian intervention is actually legal under international law. It is a new customary norm of international law. Fast forward to Syria a couple of years ago, and we actually see the UK say, we're going to intervene against Assad because he's committing atrocities against his own people. It's going to be a humanitarian intervention. And here are the circumstances under which humanitarian intervention is actually legal in international law. So that is a hugely important moment in international law. And, you know, others, uh, scholars have written about this. And, uh, for example, Harold Coe, the former legal advisor, right. has, you know, made the same argument. But we have the UK, a very powerful player in the international arena, essentially embracing this argument and saying, you know, not only are we doing this, we're using force in this uh, um, you know, a way that's not sanctioned by the UN Charter, but we're also claiming that this is legal under international law under this very um, carefully delineated legal framework. Let me just chime in for a moment to say what's even more striking about that moment was that right after the UK said that, the US ambassador to the UN, Nikki Haley, said, quote, we are in full agreement and in lockstep with the United Kingdom. And now there are people who have tried to deconstruct this and say, oh, she wasn't authorized to say that. She acted independently from the Trump administration. She had a lot of authority. But it doesn't matter under international law when your ambassador 
to the United Nations gives that kind of statement, it is binding and it is new law on your country. The other thing that I've heard people try to say in deconstructing her statement is, oh, what she was talking about is we were in full agreement and in lockstep in the targeting selection. But that's not how anybody's interpreting it. So to me, that was the moment together with what the United Kingdom said that made it a Groshen moment. One of those things about diplomacy is uh, that the negotiating table is always made of fire and it's really tough to take an idea like that back, useful or, or, or otherwise. But Paul, let me switch gears slightly. Um, we, we've got a, a, a terrific queue of, of questions lined up and I want to I want to give our, our audience a chance to be heard. Um, but uh, you spent a lot of time as a legal advisor, as we said at the outset, to the Syrian peace negotiations. Can you tell us what's been unique about these negotiations and, and indeed where they stand now? What, what's the status of those talks? Okay. Currently, the status of the talks is they're stalled around constitutional negotiations. And ever since the talks were launched uh, in Geneva, the government has by and large showed up but then simply not negotiated. Uh, the opposition uh, has come to the table to negotiate. The mediators have tried various ways of, of getting the parties to negotiate. So it's, it's almost this, this ghost negotiation where people show up in Geneva um, and hardly any progress is made. But what's been interesting and unique is before the Security Council sort of clicked into its, its, its own version of the lockdown, um, it was highly engaged in managing the substance and the agenda of the negotiations. So usually a Security Council resolution calls for a ceasefire, return of refugees, protection of human rights, ceasing of atrocities. They did that as well. But early on, the Security Council went further and said, and there will be regime change. They didn't say regime change. They said there'll be a transitional governing body. It will be negotiated with both the regime and the opposition. Um, there will then be free and fair elections. Um, the Security Council uh, embraced a new constitution. They eventually walked it back to constitutional reform. And they even, in their earlier resolutions, uh, embraced transitional justice. So having the Security Council basically actively engaged in not only setting the process, but setting the agenda and setting the outcomes, you're going to have a transitional government. That means you're not going to have Assad in power. You're going to have elections. You're going to have a new, a new constitution. Now, again, that's been sort of, and if you buy the book on amazon.com uh, or cambridge. You, know, um, you can um, we can track how it is that they were very assertive and aggressive, and then it was sort of manipulated and morphed. Um, and then it's basically the Security Council has, has gone AWOL on this, but the UN envoy keeps moving forward with an effort to try to um, jumpstart these negotiations. Thank you so much. Mindful of our time, I, I wanna, give uh, Milena and Michael and you all a, a, a chance to uh, to react to one of the meta criticisms and, and you you address this in the book uh, in the concluding chapters uh, you say that there are four criticisms of of Groshen moment as a concept uh, how do you respond in particular to the concern that it's just too early to tell whether the changes you describe in the book that grow out of the Syria experience uh, it, it, is that, are those really authentically new rules of international law? Is that learning that you cite there really something that changes the terrain that we've all studied and try to understand? Melina, can I ask you to take a shot? Sure. So it is, you know, that's a great question, Kevin. And it, Kevin, it is absolutely true that several decades of now, from now, we will have the benefit of better hindsight if we might know better, you know, what exactly happened, how international law evolved. And there's certainly numerous books I could cite about, let's say, the Vietnam War, where the author is writing the book today about something that happened, you know, 50 years ago. So definitely, you know, decades from now, we will have perhaps better answers. But we think that there's sufficient evidence as of today to make the claim that we're making, which is that the Syrian conflict has constituted these Groshen moments and has contributed to the development, of, to, to the accelerated development of customary law in these specific areas, such as, for example, humanitarian intervention, the law of self-defense as it applies to non-state actors, uh, global migration, et cetera. So we think that there is enough evidence as of now to, to make these claims. <laughs> 
Michael, Paul, any, any final thoughts before we turn to our audience for questions? You know, I, I will just quote from our book on, on page 178. Um, we do say that during times of international flux, it may be easy to spot a turning point that is not really there. And, and yes, we're out there on a limb. We're taking a risk. Um, we're not even Monday morning quarterbacks. Uh, we are trying to make a determination while the conflict is still ongoing. And for that reason, we are starting a conversation. And as Melena says, it, it may be years before we know the, the final outcome of it. Paul? Um, I would just say that you can tell from the chat stream that we have definitely started a conversation. <laughs> well, that's, that's the beginning of all wisdom, uh, to, 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 uh, uh, to have the modesty to know you may not have answered all the questions. Uh, and indeed, uh, let me ask our producer, Eric Seiler, if he would, uh, who's been curating, uh, and I, Eric, I don't envy you the job, uh, all of these high quality thoughts. Uh, could you uh, throw a couple of questions out to our panelists, please? One person is interested in knowing your view about prospects of international prosecutions for the atrocities committed in Syria. Do you think it can constitute a component of any future transitional justice schemes? If so, what format could it be? Ad hoc, ad hoc tribunal, regional tribunal, hybrid tribunal, or resorting to universal jurisdiction prosecutions? So I'll, I'll start off on that one. Thank you, Eric, and, and thank you, who, uh, whoever asked the question. You know, I started off by telling that story of how Paul and I were running away from the tear gas um, riot police, uh, along with the students, and what we were doing in Turkey. And what we were doing was drafting a statute for a regional or international or even domestic trial of major war criminals from Syria. What was unusual about our statute is that we were reflecting the different options that the Syrians themselves wanted to consider. And rather than have one definitive statute, we had a whole bunch of options and underneath each one, we explained what the ramifications were. And I have heard from experts in the field who teach international criminal law that they are now using this statute as a way to teach international criminal law. So we included the statute as an appendix in our book, if you want to check out what's in there. Um, I am less optimistic that in the short term, the Syrians are going to be able to have justice in their country for Assad and other regime leaders. And as Malena said, it's probably going to start out in other countries like Germany and France under universal jurisdiction. But there's one thing I know that's a truism about international criminal law, and that is that international justice is patient and persistent. And you think about the people who are being prosecuted for the Cambodia genocide today, 30 years later, you think about the German concentration camp commanders and guards who were prosecuted 50, 60, 70 years later, ultimately, the people in Syria who used chemical weapons and who committed other atrocities, they're going to pay the price, the price of a justice. And I would, I would just jump in here and add that during the negotiations, this quite accountability is put on the table every single round. Every time the opposition goes to the negotiations, they put on the table accountability because, you know, they're aware that justice is persistent and patient and they may not get Assad before the International Criminal Court or hybrid tribunal in the next two or three or four years. But, but they're well aware, you know, Bashir from Sudan, uh, the new government uh, has committed to turn him over to the International Criminal Court for the genocide in Darfur and the crimes against humanity. He was indicted over a decade ago. Um, and so there is this notion that they need to preserve justice uh, in the peace agreement or in the context of these negotiations so that they can have that long arm long arm of the law kevin i would just add that you know to get very specific about various accountability options here the international criminal court itself is of limited use because as some of our listeners might know it can really only prosecute crimes that took place on the territory of a member state or if the perpetrator is a national of a member state which means that really only foreign fighters in Syria that come from ICC member states could actually be prosecuted by the ICC. So Syrians themselves could not. Uh, 
when it comes to establishing an ad hoc tribunal similar to the Yugoslavia or the Rwanda tribunal, those were created through um, Security Council resolutions. And here, at least for now, we have the Russian and perhaps Chinese veto, so that, that cannot take place. And so what we see for now is two things. One, as I already mentioned, prosecutions in some European countries, notably Germany, under the principle of universal jurisdiction. So there is a trial ongoing in Germany and some other um, investigations and prosecutions in Sweden, France, Austria. And then the other thing that we saw was the creation, as, as Michael mentioned earlier, the creation of the so-called triple IM um, that was created through a general assembly resolution to get around the Security Council. The triple IM is not a court, it is a body that's for now amassing evidence, documents of atrocities, but hopefully someday it will be able to transfer that, 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 that the, the evidence and the documents to some future accountability mechanism. Thank you all so much. Eric, uh, we, uh... I have a feeling we haven't exhausted the questions. Can you uh, offer some more? Of course. Next question. How did the wave of refugees have a destabilization effect on the European countries? Milena, I think that's custom made for you. Sure. Um, you know, when I said that, I didn't necessarily mean in a negative way, but it is true that the influx of large numbers of migrants and refugees has had a profound impact on um, some, some specific countries which have actually taken in a large number of refugees and migrants. And here I would single out Germany and Turkey. So Turkey took out the, took in the um, most number of migrants and refugees, like several, I think the estimate is about 3 million. Um, and Germany among, um, you know, Western European nations uh, took in about a, close to a half a million of migrants and refugees. So there are different ways in which these countries have, have, have dealt with the large um, influx of refugees and migrants. As I mentioned earlier in Germany, it meant um, rethinking the entire asylum procedure because for those of you who are, who are specialists in refugee law, you might know that the legal definition of a refugee is very specific and very narrow. And in some instances, it's very difficult to draw the line between a refugee and a migrant, and only refugees qualify for asylum procedures, not migrants. So Germany, instead of dealing with all that, said, well, we're not going to, you know, we're not going to do it that way. We're simply going to start issuing one to three year work permits and work visas to these new arrivals, and we're going to give them a chance to basically, you know, learn German, try to find a job, try to, um, you know, integrate, for lack of a better word, and then we'll see down the road what we do with them. In Turkey, it meant, um, again, using biometric data to process the arrivals, simplifying, again, asylum procedures to, to make sure that those who are arriving in such large numbers can actually be tracked and, and processed. And this has definitely caused a backlash in some of these countries, particularly in Turkey. There is a significant backlash. The Turks were saying basically that's too many Syrians. They're taking out of our, our jobs. You know, the, the, the typical narrative that you see um, as a backlash anytime you have um, larger groups of, you know, so-called others coming in. Well, I appreciate you uh making the, the point about both uh, Germany and Turkey. I was in uh, Jordan in January, and uh, I would add them to the list of uh, innovative countries uh, taking on far more uh, than their share of the burden. Um, that, that's a great answer, though. Er Eric, uh, uh, what, what's next, please? What do you anticipate will happen in Syria in the next few years from a factual perspective? Do you think the crisis will dissipate? And from a legal slash judicial point of view, do you think there's a real chance of reaching accountability? Paul, why don't you take that? Oh, thanks, Michael. Um, <laughs> yeah, so every few months when we were involved in the process, um, I would ask my, my colleagues uh, that were on the US Envoys team um, from the various agencies, uh, right? So you know we're on the upswing. This this is this is getting better, right? And they're like, no. And I'm like, wait. Well, how can it get worse? And they're like, just wait and see. And every single time after a round of Geneva or Astana, wherever we were, within the next three to four months, it got worse. And so I'd love to say, look we're nearing the end um, and you know, it's, it's coming on a decade. That would be a time one would think this, this conflict would, would end. The Iranians are there to stay. Hezbollah is dug in. The Russians 
are trapped. I think they probably like to leave now, but I think they're trapped to a degree. The Americans have very serious strategic interests with Al Qaeda and ISIS operating in Syria. And the Turks have just occupied, you know, 20 kilometers along their border. This can continue to get much worse. And, and, and I was always the optimist on that, but I think my colleagues at the US government were like, look, you gotta be serious about this. It's gonna get worse, which is the call to action to do something. Um, I know we're lawyers and the book is about law, um, but um, you know, as, as, the universe, as the world emerges from, from COVID, Syria will still be there and it will still require um, intense and affirmative action by the international community to bring this conflict to an end. It will not burn itself out. Um, it, will not, it will not peter out. Let me add Michael. One, one thing. Um, just a week ago, there was a resolution that was being shopped around at the Security Council, and it had full support of all of the countries except for one. And what the resolution would have done is said, in light of the coronavirus, there should be a worldwide stoppage, a ceasefire, especially in Syria, but also in other places like in Yemen and in other major conflicts. And, and the Security Council, again, paralyzed by the veto, did not pass that resolution. Now, of course, that resolution would not have automatically done much, but it's just one more sign of a paralyzed and broken Security Council. And just as a preview, the next book that Paul, Milena, and I are working on is called Power Shift. And it takes the same theory and, and discussion that we've had about the power shifting from the Security Council because of the veto, and it looks at what that might mean for the future. Eric, I think we have time for about one more question. Uh, is the U.S. really just employing military in Syria just for fighting terrorism? Let me, Kevin, I, I think, I mean, let me, let me answer this a little bit more broadly. That, that is really a very, um, you know, well-founded and frequent criticism of this theory of humanitarian intervention. Those who are opposed say, but the concept will just be abused and misused by the very powerful countries like the United States and perhaps um, Russia, and they'll just start using force against other states and basically citing humanitarian intervention as justification. So the, the, the very cynical answer is, well, those countries already do that anyhow, right? So it's not like the United States or you know the USSR, now Russia, it's not like they have not used force against other, other countries they have. But I would argue as, as a lawyer, speaking as a lawyer, that I, I think that it's always preferable to have a detailed legal framework. And I think that the existence of a legal framework actually curbs the use of human, you know, faux humanitarian intervention because it becomes much more difficult for countries to say, well, this is a humanitarian intervention if you have legal criteria to satisfy. Now, when it comes to Syria, most of the big powers, including you know Russia and the United States, yes, everybody has their own interests to, to to support. But I would say that I, I you know I definitely believe that it is in everybody's interest to stop the bloodshed, to stop the use of chemical weapons. Um, that it would be in everybody's best interest to make sure that there is a transition to a more democratic and, and peaceful regime. We so, we do have a hard stop at five thirty, but I, Michael, I've got to ask uh, you to. Uh, to offer a, a few summary thoughts, if you would, please. Well, you know, in, in summation, I think that what we're seeing is a new way of looking at customary international law. And we're using Syria as the lens to see whether this idea of a Groshen moment is legitimate and it's useful. If you want my prediction of the next Groshen moment, it's not a crisis like a conflict, but it's probably something like global climate change. I think that that's going to create all kinds of changes in customary international law very quickly as that accelerates. And maybe that's the next book, a couple down the road. Listen, everybody, we are out of time. So Kevin Neeler, Paul Williams, Milena Stereo, thank you very much for participating in this virtual book discussion of the Syrian conflict's impact on international law. And to the 500 participants Thank you all for joining us today. It's, it's really been a pleasure.